Hi, and welcome back to this course on Goethe's novels. I'm John Noyes, and I am here to guide you through the reading of all of Goethe's novels. The year is 1795. Goethe is 45 years old, and he has just completed the first draft of his second novel, Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahre, which is usually translated as Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship. Um, I suppose if you wanted to get the full richness of Goethe's title, you would call it the Apprenticeship of William Master, the Master's Apprenticeship. Important, remember that, because the name Meister says that Wilhelm bears something within him. He bears some quality within him that predisposes him to mastery. So it's 20 years since Goethe completed The Sorrows of Young Werther. And what's he been doing in the meantime? Well, he's had quite a lot to do. In 1776, he joined the government of Duke Karl August in Weimar and he enters the service of state. He holds various positions there. He's in charge of roads works. He's in charge of the mines. Um, for a while, he's in the commission for war, which doesn't really keep him doing very much except um, counting the buttons on uniforms. And he's also active in the theater where he's a director and an actor. In 1782, he joined the nobility and henceforth could call himself Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Also important, we're going to see traces of this relationship, this difficult relationship, which we already know about between the middle classes and the nobility. We're going to see traces of that in, um, in the novel. He's also been to Italy twice, and this is also important, we're going, and we're going to see strong resonance of these trips to Italy in the novel. The first visit to Italy was a secret visit. He crept away in the middle of the night in 1786. He couldn't take the stress of government life anymore. He was tired of what he was doing, and he crept away, came back two years later, received graciously by Karl August, who led him back into government, and then officially he went to, back to Italy in 1790. So it's 1795, and what a year this is. All of Europe still has its eyes on post-revolutionary France. Three years previously, France was constituted as a republic, and it declared war with Austria and Prussia. Now, Karl August put together his troops in the aid of Prussia and marched with them to France, and Goethe was there. He was there for the Battle of Valmy. And famously, he wrote, Von hier und heute geht eine neue Epoche der Weltgeschichte aus, und ihr könnt sagen, ihr seid dabei gewesen. Starting here and today, a new epoch in world history begins, and you can say, I was there. Intellectually, this is also a really important decade for Goethe. He's increasingly engaged in scientific studies. He's working on his theory of color, which won't be published until 1810. He's also extremely interested in morphology. He published his Metamorphosis of Plants in 1790, and he's also been working on the Metamorphosis of Animals. While he was in Italy, he came up with the idea of an Urpflanze, an archetypal plant, a very important idea for him. And he shared this idea with Schiller when he met Schiller at a meeting of um, the Association for Natural Science in Jena in 1794. Also, at the beginning of this decade, when Kant's Critique of Judgment appeared in 1790, Goethe read it enthusiastically, and he would engage in discussions with Schiller about the significance of uh, Kant's aesthetic theory. Revolution is on his mind, as it is on most people's minds, in Germany, in Europe at the time. And revolution can mean two things. It can mean, quite literally, 
the revolving, the turning around, the periodic change that happens in nature. Or it can mean, more politically, more specifically, the revolutionary events in France, and also a couple of decades earlier in the United States. And the uncertainty, the ambiguity around the word revolution is important for Goethe, because the question arises, should change happen suddenly or should it happen gradually? Should nature be left to its own resources to determine change or should humans work at change? And this also means politically working at change. Goethe is quite explicit about his own views. Looking back on the year 1795, Goethe talks about how his novel was received by various friends and acquaintances. And he talks about the musician Reichardt, who actually wrote some of the songs, uh, wrote the music to some of the songs in Wilhelm Meister. And he said that Reichardt threw himself furiously into the cause of the revolution. And then he goes on to say something that's interesting for us. He says, um, but me, however, um, I was very aware of the gruesome consequences of the revolution, its violence. Um, I'd seen it with my own eyes, and I'd also seen uh, similar occult movements in um, the fatherland, in the land of his fathers. Um, and I always considered it to be best to stick to what we have, to stick with existing conditions and instead try to improve them, try to invigorate them, and try to turn them in the correct direction so that life becomes reasonable. Very important for us for understanding Goethe's politics. And I'd like to uh, give a word of caution here because when you listen to something like that, you tend to think of him as being politically conservative and thus politically not very interesting, possibly even politically reprehensible. But I want us to try and understand what made him take this viewpoint. The right way to approach Goethe's politics is to look at the concept of Bildung, because this is going to be the key to understanding his views about human nature, how human nature relates to the collective or to government or to the polity, and how to try and find some model for correct development of the individual. Um, Bildung relates directly to the revolution theme. If nature tends towards certain developments, if there are some certain developmental tendencies in nature, then how do we formalize human action? How do we talk about human action in a way where these natural developments or natural tendencies or natural potential might best be realized? In other words, how do we live natural lives? That's another way of putting it. Um, so when it comes to revolution, then at least in the understanding of many intellectuals of the time, then this is the question of natural life put to government. What is the correct form of government for fostering natural life? Bildung is also directly related to the love theme in Werther. Is love a natural attraction between individuals? Or is it a social arrangement? And this is something which continues to fascinate Goethe. We're going to return to it um, in very powerful terms when we read elective affinities. The way of looking at love that Goethe was exploring in Werther, where love is an alignment of desire with nature, this is something which is going to continue to dominate understandings of love right up to the present day under the heading romantic love. Isn't it wrong to try and force a relationship between two loving individuals into a certain social contract when in fact it is a naturally determined relationship? So now that we've gotten this far, I think you already have a pretty good sense of what Bildung is about, but let's delve deeper into it. Bildung is one of those words that's really difficult to translate into other languages. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. And for that reason, the word Bildungsroman has um, found its way into the English language, um, often translated as the novel of education, but I think that's not a very good translation. Um, 
But um, in any event, whenever you read about the Bildungsroman, one of the first novels that gets mentioned is Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, for very good reason, because this is a novel about the natural development, fostering the inherent natural potential that lies within a middle-class individual, and trying to do so within the constraints of class society. So, what is Bildung? I have with me this uh, rather magnificent uh, book. Um, it's a heavy book, um, it's, and it uh, basically um, hides my face. It's called uh, The Dictionary of Untranslatables, um, edited by Barbara Kassan. And um, she has a really good entry under the term Bildung, which I would recommend to anyone who wants to understand the full richness of this term. And I'm just going to mention a couple of things that Kassan says. Um, she points out, she making reference to an etymological dictionary, always a good place to start, she talks about um, the etymology of the term Bildung, which derives from the word Bild, uh, which in English is picture or image. Um, at first it signified creation, fabrication, and the fact of giving form. And this is absolutely central. This is why we shouldn't just talk about education, because Bildung is the fact of giving form. Um, and uh, Kassan also notes that um, the essential dimension that the term Bildung acquires around 1800 is that of reflexivity. The development that Bildung implies is not only the acquisition of competences with a view to improvement, education, but corresponds to a process of the self-fashioning of the individual, who becomes what he was at the outset, who reconciles himself with his essence. And um, as Kassan notes, this was the meaning of the word which Hegel discusses in um, the fourth part of the phenomenology. And one final idea from Kassan, which is important for our understanding of Goethe, um, the French occupation of Germany during the Revolutionary Wars, and especially during the Napoleonic Wars, was a sort of incubation period during which the concept of Bildung acquired its central place in Germany's philosophical self-image. The French period of German history is characterized by a radical reduction of spatial fragmentation and the emergence of the idea of a German state that would be the heir to the Enlightenment, that is, a pedagogical state. And we will encounter Goethe's suspicion of a pedagogical state as a utilitarian project when he comes to describing the pedagogical province in Wilhelm Meister's journeyman years. In a letter to his friend Werner that we find in Book 5, Chapter 3, this is one of the decisive moments of the book, Wilhelm explains what he understands by the word Bildung. I have an irresistible desire to attain the harmonious development of my personality, such as was denied me by my birth. Um, the, the English translation misses some of the key words that we find in the German. So I'm going to take you to the German now. What Goethe wrote was, Ich habe nun einmal gerade zu jener harmonischen Ausbildung meiner Natur, die mir meine Geburt versagt, eine unwiderstehliche Neigung. In the English we read of the harmonious development of my personality. Harmonious development is a pretty good translation of harmonische Ausbildung. But Goethe writes Ausbildung meiner Natur, not my personality, but my nature. And we, we have to read this in the sense that Kassan was talking about. It's an actualization of an existing natural potential. And, and then finally, where the, uh, where the English says, <clears throat> I have an irresistible desire, the German was eine unwiderstehliche Neigung. So it's an inclination, and 
Okay, desire is, um, it's kind of along those same lines, but the inclination, I think anyway, is closer to the idea of a natural potential. I'd now like to briefly explore three dimensions of the idea of Bildung, which I think are important for Goethe. The first is an organicist notion of development and formation and form acquisition. And the key person there is Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. The second point I want to mention is the alignment of Bildung and historical development, or Bildung and the collective. And the key person is Johann Gottfried Herder. And then finally, there's the idea that Bildung or self-actualization is in some sense a resistance to fate. And the key person there is Leibniz. So Blumenbach was a natural scientist, an important natural scientist at the time. Goethe met him and he corresponded with him right up until his death. Blumenbach is generally regarded as the founder of scientific anthropology and physical anthropology. In 1780 and 1781, he authored a treatise which he called Über den Bildungstrieb und das Zeugungsgeschäft on the formative drive and procreation. Der Bildungstrieb, the formative drive. And it was an attempt to revise certain views on evolution that were common at the time. Blumenbach's main argument was that the development of individuals is governed by a principle of generation and regeneration. And um, I'm just going to read what he wrote. He said that in all animated creatures from the human to the maggot and from the cedar down to mold, there is a specific innate drive that is active for as long as life persists. First, a drive to assume a particular form, then to maintain it, and if it's damaged, to repair it as far as possible. A drive or tendency or striving, however one wants to call it, which I shall hear in order to avoid all misinterpretation and distinguish it from other forces of nature, call the formative drive. So it's a drive or it's a striving, a striving, this word which is going to be so important for Goethe when he writes Faust, striving, almost being the essence of life. So that's the one thing. There is an organic dimension of this drive to assume the form that nature inherently has placed within you as an individual. Point two concerns Herder. This isn't the first time we've encountered Herder, and it's certainly not going to be the last one, because he had such a strong influence on Goethe, particularly in Goethe's youth, but throughout um, Herder's life. Herder died in 1803. So by the time that Herder wrote the biological meaning of Bildung, the one that I just talked about with respect to Blumenbach, it was starting to coalesce with other more literal understandings of the term. Um, such as the form giving education that's desirable when it comes to creating a whole and rounded person. This was education in the sense of Rousseau. And Herder does also take this step when he wrote his study called Auch eine Philosophie der Geschichte, this too a philosophy of history, um, 1774. He spoke of a common project for the betterment of humanity. And in this common project, individual deeds appear like the seeds of a plant. And he calls it the noblest plant of humanity, civilization, Bildung, strengthening of nature in its most imperfect nerves, love of human beings, sympathy, and brotherly bliss. So, in striving for a unity of humanity, these formative deeds, they nurture the soul as a seat of human life. And they don't dwell on merely bodily or political purposes. Um, this idea of Bildung, self-formation, self-expression, self-development, self-education, education as a natural force, th this is a clue to the fact that 
what we have here is we have an ongoing debate with Leibniz, who had understood the life of the individual as an expression of the force of nature. Now, it's been claimed that Leibniz's understanding of the life of the individual as an expression of the force of nature works against political action. It works against political reform and revolution, because if life is an expression of nature, then surely everything that you live out and act out is already as it should be and need not be some kind of resistance to fate. And in fact, in this sense, Werther, it has been suggested, is a counter-narrative to the ideas of Leibniz. I don't want to go into that any further, but I just want to point out these three important dimensions of Bildung. The organicist dimension, Blumenbach, the collective dimension, Herder, and then the dimension that addresses fate and political action, Leibniz. And this brings us directly to the multidimensional question of the Bildungsroman. And that is, how do you tell the story of lives lived successfully and lives that fail? How do you understand the writing process itself as an act of artistic Bildung? That is, the reader watching the writer allowing the inherent character to develop, but also pushing it in certain directions. And this disconnect between the self-expression of the character and the way the character is being observed from the outside by the narrator introduces a dimension of irony, an important dimension of irony, which gives the novel Wilhelm Meister some of its clout. So I hope to have given you a few useful pointers for understanding the idea of the Bildungsroman and the concept of Bildung. Next week we're going to be taking this further and we'll be talking about class and the theatre and the idea of a public. See you then. Bye.